Okay, so I think it's the time to start. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for taking your time to join this webinar, this fourth webinar. Luckily, I'm, I was not forced to join this fourth talk. I have to thank Antonio Palas for the invitation for having me here. As you can see, a lot of logos in, in the in the screen. I come from China University of Petroleum uh, in Qingdao, but most of my work uh, in this presentation was carried out when I was uh, in German Geoscience Research Center in post time and uh, my work for Geosphore, both under the supervision of Brian Hosfield. And Brian is also here today. Uh, the project was initially pro sponsored by AKBP, Repsol, Lending, and Total. And this is how we we did the, the project. And, and of course, after this, I did some extra work and we present. Uh, of course, I think everyone knows we are going to talk about applications of bond biomarkers in petroleum exploration. In fact, most of the work I'm going to present today has been published in the recent years. We see the, the latest one was just uh, available online two days ago on January uh, 23rd. Uh, so I, I got many slides, but I, I will try to uh, 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 give the presentation uh, quickly. Perhaps if you have any questions, we can uh, discuss in the end. So first of all, I'd like to introduce bond biomarkers and the our method to release bond biomarkers. I've, I'm, pre I'm pretty sure everyone knows biomarkers, but someone might be uh, wondering what uh, are bond biomarkers. And after that, we will compare free and bond biomarkers and then talk about possible applications and some summary and outlook in the end. And uh, let's start with the, the formation of biomarkers. We know biomarkers are formed from the lipid precursors, which contains like say, steroid or hopinoid structures. So in the free form, they can be transformed directly to hopins or stearines, but more often they are incorporated into the carriage macro structure. And to be part of the carriage, and with increasing thermal stress, of course, carriage start to crack to generate oil and gas and also to release bond uh, to release biomarkers. So these greens are the free biomarkers we're talking about. Uh, but we know there are still some a steroid or a hopinoid structure left in the carriage, and they are bond via the, the chemical bond. And that's why we call them bond biomarkers. Uh, from another perspective, let's say in a petroleum system, we have organic matter. Some are solved, uh, can be uh, uh, um, re resolved in normal solvent. We call them bitumen. Well, the insoluble part is carrageen. We know it. From the bitumen, we have the saturated aromatic uh, fraction, so we can carry out uh, GCFID or GCMS to check the normal alkenes or biomarkers. Well, from the uh, bigger part, asphaltene, they are they are smaller than carrageen, but much bigger than uh, normal uh, biomarkers. Uh, some people say they they are the intermediate between carrageen and oil. Of course, they contain a lot of information of the carrageen. Uh, which produced this asphaltene. Uh, as we said, there are some uh, biomarker moisties still uh, chemically bound in this carrageen or asphaltene macrostructures, and that's we call them bond biomarkers. We we know uh, we are using a lot of free biomarkers, and we have the biomarker guide from from Kenneth Peters. Why do we bother to to check the bond biomarkers? Because we might have some problems when we use free biomarkers. In a petroleum system, we have source rock, we have reservoir from the source rock. We often uh, come across the drilling mud contamination on the cuttings. So the, the biomarker of the cuttings can be easily contaminated. 
from the reservoir part, biodegradation can alter the the, the free biomarkers and some oil mixing from different sources or from different uh, terms of generation can also mess up the biomarker fingerprints. That's why we we have to uh, check the bond biomarkers. How can we release bond biomarkers from the macro structure? Well, basically, two uh, two ways: chemical degradation or the more aggressive pyrolysis. For chemical degradation, I'm not going to name them one by one, but generally they are time consuming and has a low efficiency. And mostly people work on the NSO related biomarkers like uh, uh, desulfurization to check uh, uh, chemically degraded biomarkers. Uh, more often we use pyrolytic method. In the early days, people checked the open pyrolysis or hydro, hydrous pyrolysis, but the efficiency was also very low. Uh, some of you might heard about the high pi hydrous pyrolysis, and we are working on the MS3 uh, hydrogenation. We know MS3 was invented by, by Hosfeld in 1989. In recent years, we developed the MS3 hydrogenation method to release biomarkers. Let's just focus on these two um, most effect effective methods. For high pi, it's an open system pyrolysis. The most significant significant feature is we use uh, high pressure hydrogen as a hydrogen donor to release biomarkers. While in MS3, we seal the sample in a small glass tube. So we have sand here, sample together with tetraline and uh, platinum dioxide, and then seal it. Why we use tetraline? This because it act, acts as a hydrogen donor, a similar function as the hydrogen gas in the high pi system. And platinum dioxide works as a catalyst to promote the generation. And then we seal the tube, and put it into an oven and heat it uh, from 200 degrees to, two, to 390 degrees at the heating rate of 0.7. Why we use this heating condition? We actually, we, we tested different uh, heating programs and found this is the most proper way. So anyway, this is how we uh, process the sample and release the biomarkers. Uh, why the MSSV is is uh, effective or better? Uh, there are many ways. First of all, it's uh, more easy to be used. As we say, we don't use the very dangerous high hydrogen um, gas. It's cheaper. More importantly, the sample amount is much lower compared with high pi and hydrous pyrolysis. For MSSV, HY just one milligram or half milligram is enough for the biomarker release. This is very important when we are dealing with very precious samples or the very poor asphaltine. We know that if we want to achieve a pure asphaltine, that could be quite difficult. I'll explain in the next slide. So, um, a basic workflow for the MSSV hydrogenation. We, we are dealing with rock samples or oil samples. For rock sample, we uh, do the extraction first to, re, uh, to get the free biomarkers. Of course, we have bitumen first, then asphaltine precipitation, MPLC, to get the aliphatic biomarkers. Basically, we after extraction, we have free biomarkers and the extracted shale, which has no free biomarkers. Then we heat the sample with the MSSV HY to release the bond biomarkers. For oil sample, we carry out the asphalting precipitation using the Toya Kohn method. Uh, she was a PhD student with, in GFZ. She developed a, a very strict uh, way to, to do the asphalting precipitation. Basically, the just repeating the asphalting, asphalting precipitation steps again and again to completely remove the free biomarkers. In this way, we have we separate free biomarkers and the asphaltine. Then we heat this asphaltine to release the asphaltine bond biomarkers. So uh, then the next part, I'm going to compare the carriage the free biomarkers in the in the rock 
and the carrying bond biomarkers and the free oil biomarkers and the asphaltene bond biomarkers. This is the second part of free against the bond biomarkers. Uh, first of all, let's check the source rock samples. We have a big database. We work on the marine shale in the green color and the lacustrine shale and some very young delta X sediments. From marine shale, we have samples from Norway, Canada, USA. Um, very basic information. We have different um, carrion type, different maturity from immature to high mature. I checked uh, the aliphatic biomarkers at different thermal maturity stage. Here we have three biomarkers. So we extract the already generated biomarkers, the increase with increasing maturity and then decrease, something similar like the oil generation. But for bond biomarkers, they are very high at immature stage. If we check the look at the circle, which are marine shale, uh, they are high at immature stage, then the generation potential decrease with increasing maturity, similar as the HI hydrogen index, because they are converted to free biomarkers and some are correct or released uh, at a high maturity stage. And in fact, we checked both aliphatic and aromatic biomarkers. For aromatic biomarkers, a typical uh, chromatograph is like this, is they are full of such kind of aromatic compounds. They are not the typical aromatic biomarkers we are looking for, like the aromatic steroids or naphthrene. These are the byproducts of the tetraline we added to the, to the system. So it's kind of a, uh, influencing the, the typical aromatic biomarkers. But anyway, we know aromatic biomarkers are quite sensitive to high temperature, so they will be changed by, by the uh, pyrolysis condition anyway. Let's just put our focus on the aliphatic biomarkers. Um, let's have a very um, brief overview on the samples. These samples are marine shale. These are non-marine shale samples. We, we see the, the red dots represent the stearines. These are stearines, these are the hopins. For marine shale, we have stearines and hopins. Sometimes stearines are a little bit lower than hopins. Sometimes they are similar. But for the non-marine input, the stearines are exclusively low, which, which they are showing the input of eukaryote against the prokaryote. Um, if we compare the free steering over hopping against bond steering over hopping, we see they are pretty well correlated. Although the, the values are different, we see free steering is four here, but for the bond steering, it's just half of the value, but they are kind of correlated. We can use this formula to convert the bond uh, ratios into the free ratios. This is a brief overview on the biomarkers. Now let's have a detailed check on the hopins and the stearines. Take the droplet sample, for example. On the left, we have free hopins and bond hopins. Uh, from, from the free hopin, we have TS, TM27, 30, 31, and gamma serine, things like this. In the bond hopins, they are kind of similar, but also differences can be noticed. Like there's very little TS, very high TM. C29 hopping is high, C30 hopping is relatively low. Uh, if we check the steerings, there are dire steerings in the free biomarkers, but dire steerings very low uh, in the bond fraction. Why? Because TS and the dire steerings, they are the so-called rearranged biomarkers. And these rearranged biomarkers are formed uh, under the clay catalytic effect uh, in the in the rock. So they are not part of the carrying structure. They are the uh, catalytic effect uh, product of the stearines or hopinoids in, in the rock. Um, and that's why when we correct the carrying, we don't have this TS or the, the diastereins. 
So in this way, we have to be careful. The TS over TM here is not a it's not a, a maturity indicator anymore in the bond fraction. Why uh, C29 hoping is is pretty high compared with C30 hoping. Uh, first of all, this is a common phenomenon in all the uh, paralytic methods, including high pi, including hydrospirosis. A possible explanation could be the destruction, selective destruction of C30 hopping in the pyrolysis uh, condition at high temperature. But anyway, we can see a lot of similarities like the relative distribution of C31, 32, 33, 34, 35, and um, the, the homo hopping index, and also the C, the steering 27, 28, 29, 30, uh, steering distribution, we see they are strikingly similar between the free and the bond fractions. Uh, if we check the other samples, we have Dropna, Poseidonia, Duvenet, Ecovolt, Wilden, similar uh, things can be found. I'm not going to detail uh, uh, here. Uh, let's say, for example, the the C30 steering, which is a marine input indicator, they are abundant in these two samples, very low in these two samples. Similar phenomena can be found in the bond, bond fraction. These are the free biomarkers. These are the bond biomarkers. And we also tested the reproducibility of the method. We checked the Poseidonia shield, used the same method to carry out the uh, the experiment in different days, uh, they show very high reproducibility. The products are very uh, highly reproducible. Um, next, we want to compare some parameters, right? If we open the biomarker guide, there are a lot of parameters. We're not using them all. We are going to select some of them. And the principle are, first of all, the 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 compounds has to present in the bond fraction of the biomarkers and uh, secondly that their abundance should be relatively high and the, the geological meaning should be clear you know there are some parameters they just don't have a very specific uh, uh, geological meaning and we are not going to use them as uh, one of the uh, parameters we are using are the C28 over 29 steering, which is an in indicator for terrestrial input, like the C29. We see a very good correlation between the free biomarkers and the bond fraction, except this, this carbonate rich eagle fort shale. And C30 over C29, which is a marine indicator, marine input indicator, we also see very, very good correlation between these two. If we plot them into the ternary diagram, these are on the left, we have three biomarkers. Most marine shale are plotted here. And if we check the bond biomarkers, they are plotted in a similar area, very similar area for this, um, uh, this uh, young delta X elements, is they are plotted here. Uh, if we check hoppings, this is uh, 27, 29 over 30 hopping. Also good correlation, but this time the relative, the absolute uh, value are different. We see here is uh, 21.2, here we got 0.9. So we need some kind of conversion using this empirical uh, formula. This is home hopping index, good correlation between them. 1.2 here, here is 2.0. So in other words, if we have a bond home hopping index like here, we use this uh, uh, formula to convert it back to the free value. We also check the maturity indicators, the C29, steering beta, beta over alpha, alpha, or S over R. Good correlation can be found. So, hopping uh, maturity indicators also show very good correlations. So, um, these are the shale samples. We also want to check the oil samples. In other words, we, we want to look at the asphaltine bond biomarkers. Do they behave the same as kerogen bi uh, bond biomarkers? And the samples we investigated uh, come from uh, North Sea, Central Graben or Viking Graben. Um, the 
central graphon, we have 225 oil, this very special one. We also have the Weilheim oil. And they are plotted as uh, together with the source rock sample. These great, great dots represent uh, our source rock database. The green samples are also a shale, but they are the possible source rock for this Owenham oil. In the drop node, we have three drop node samples, and they are pretty heterogeneous. This drop node three sample has a clear terrestrial in influence. It can be shown by other parameters, but these two samples are always plotted together uh, with the Alvinham oil. And also here, we see the C28 over 29 stearines. This Oil samples are plotted together with source rock. So two information in this slide. First of all, the kerogen bond biomarkers plotted uh, together with the kerogen uh, bond biomarkers. That means the oil, the kerogen bond, and the asphaltene bond biomarkers behave similar. Second point is uh, the, the oil, oil bond biomarker plot together as uh, with its source rock bond biomarkers. If we check the maturity, again, the, the asphaltene biomarkers fall on the trend line. They are on the trend line, but they show higher maturity compared with the possible source rock of these drop node samples. So these are the, the foundation of our application. That means the free biomarkers and bond biomarker, biomarkers are similar, but are different, but they, they contain a lot of similar information. The first uh, application is the possible drilling mud contamination. We artificially contaminate our uh, powder to, to test the, the, the application. So we have a, a shale powder. We extract it to have the uh, free biomarker of the, of the shale. And also we contaminate it with the drilling mud uh, at high temperature with a pretty long time. So this contaminated um, shale powder contain uh, a mixture of original biomarker and contaminant. But then we extract it, have the contaminated biomarkers and the, the extracted powder. After that, we heat the powder to release the newly bound biomarkers. So in this way, we have different fractions of biomarkers. We have the free original biomarker, we have the contaminated biomarker, and the newly released bond biomarkers. We are expecting to see the bond biomarkers should tell some true story about the original free biomarkers. First of all, we have to know how the contaminant lo look like. This is the biomarker uh, characteristics of the uh, a contaminant, a very low steering over, over uh, hopping ratio, very low TS over TM, a high gamma steering. Um, there's no C30 steering. So uh, in my opinion, it's like a lacustrine originated oil. Uh, that is the contaminant. We artificially uh, contaminated four samples actually a marine shale, the troponin shale, a lacustrine shale, the weirden shale, a sulfur rich sample, loam sample, and a carbonate rich equivalent shale. These are the original free biomarker. Uh, how they look like? Pretty different stearines and hoppings. After contamination, we checked the free biomarkers again. They are just the same the same as the contaminant, so they are completely contaminated. Then we wash out the contaminant and release the bond biomarkers, and they are different again, and of course show the features of the original biomarkers. If we check the stearines, these are the original uh, uh, stearines, these are contaminated stearines, these are the cleaned bond stearines. Bond stearines are pretty similar as the original ones. Uh, similar story as the hoppings. I'm not going to too much details because I have also have other slides. So if we plot the, the stearines into the ternary diagram, these are the original samples. These are after contamination, they are shifted 
to this area. If we check the bond biomarkers, they are shifted back to how it looked like uh, as the original ones. Also maturity indicators. Um, this line shows the, the features of the, of the contaminant and the red uh, square shows the free original features. So in fact, the original uh, uh, maturity of the Dropner, Wilden and Lones, they are a little bit lower uh, less mature than the contaminant. The last sample is more mature. In the bond biomarkers, this, these features can be shown by the bond biomarkers. The green dots show lower maturity and high maturity, low maturity and high maturity. So that means the maturity can also be reflected by the bond biomarkers. The second application is uh, biodegradation. We checked uh, Four samples, two from North Sea, they are very slightly biodegraded. And two barren sea samples, they are more heavily biodegraded. For this sample, we see the a higher pristine and fighting. For the barren sea sample, they are kind of complex. This one is clearly biodegraded with high UCM and uh, the normal alkenes are depleted. This one is a is a mixture of biodegraded sample and fresh oil samples. If we check the, the stearines, the, the less biodegraded samples has pretty intact stearine distribution, C27, 28, 29, 30 hoppings. Uh, but for the barren samples, we have C27, 28, 29, and 30 are almost gone. And uh, we we can argue uh, in theory they can be caused by some fishes variation, but we know they are biodegraded. We have uh, many other evidence to to show this. Uh, if we check the bond biomarkers, the C29 and the stearines are brought back. We can check them, and also the C30 stearine, which is a marine input indicator, can also be shown in the bond fraction. For the less biodegraded sample, they are the distributions are very, very similar, except the absence of the rearranged stearines. Also, if we plot them into the, uh, the template, uh, the, the formula, the less biodegraded samples, the North Sea samples, they fall on the trend line. But these heavily biodegraded samples, they are out of the trend line. Why? Because the free biomarkers are altered by the biodegradation and the bond biomarkers are telling the true characteristics of these samples. <clears throat> Hopping are less uh, altered, influenced by biodegradation. That's why there's only one sample fall out of the thread line and we use bi bond biomarkers can shift it back to, to its normal values. Also, the ternary diagram, we have three biomarkers, the fresh sample, biodegraded sample, they are separated from each other. If we check the bond biomarkers, in fact, they are, uh, they were deposited in relatively similar uh, environment. And the third one is about uh, charging history. Uh, we checked the samples from the Green Alvin, Alfheim and Central Graben area. In this way, we, we checked a different part of the free and bond biomarkers. Uh, this schematic diagram shows how the um, oil charged the, the reservoir. And in this diagram, it shows, of course, this is one theory. They say the early charged oil with asphaltene, they just occupy the, the surface of mineral. And then the later charged oil, they have the the mineral surface are already occupied. They have no place to, to, to absorb on the mineral surface, so they can just walk around in the free space. In this work, we checked uh, again here. We have the mineral here. We have the extract, uh, the, the baked asphaltene absorbed on the uh, mineral. And we have also some produced oil out of this reservoir. So we, we, Analyze the produced oil 
both free and bound fraction, this part, and the reservoir extract, which are left into the uh, in the in the reservoir and compare them. For the free oil, we have free biomarkers on the left and bound biomarkers on the right. For the uh, reservoir extract, we have free biomarkers on the left and bound on the right. And these samples are from the Tor, Ecofisk, and Eldfisk. Uh, let's, uh, let's call them TEE, T samples. For the free biomarkers, we see this. 27, 28, 29, the 27 and 29 are uh, roughly the same uh, amount. And we also have some marine input. But in the bond biomarkers, we have a much higher uh, input from 29, C29, which is uh, some show some influence from terrestrial input. And there's no C30 input uh, from the bond biomarkers. Why this is happening? We also uh, checked other parameters. Uh, for all the Norwegian um, samples we investigated, we can classify them into two groups. The first group is uh, free biomarkers and bound biomarkers. They show similar characteristics and they fall on the tread line. Examples include Alvenheim sample and 225 sample. But these TEE samples, they they fall out of the tread line. They show some unique features. If we check the uh, steroids or hoppings. Also, if we check the maturity indicator, the Alvenham sample, they always fall on the tread line. But the TEE samples sometimes fall out of the tread line, show very different features. So our uh, assumption is this reservoir extract bond biomarkers represent a very early charging or the first charging. The first charging was uh, come from some um, terrestrial influenced uh, source rock as they contain a high C29 steering, no C30 steering. They just occupy the, the surface of the minerals. And then there's another later major charging to the reservoir and they their characteristics can be represented by the free biomarkers because it's main major charging. If we uh, check the free biomarkers, they show a typical marine uh, input. So the later charging was uh, produced from a Jurassic or uh, source rock, marine source rock. Uh, While well, the bond produced oil biomarkers is some something uh, between these two end members. It's like an intermediate. Some other application, uh, this is a, a very a small topic. Uh, it's about the four missile steerings we have shown before. For Marantia, we have in the free biomarker, we have 28, 20, 27, 28, 29, 30 steerings. Uh, similar distribution can be found in the bond biomarkers. But for uh, the lacustrine shale, we have 27, 28, 29, can also be shown in the bond biomarkers. But we also have these red uh, peaks. They are four missile steerings, which are um, indicator for lacustrine algae. They are absent in the bond biomarkers. And that means these four, steering, four missile steerings are not part of the carotene structure, just like TS and the diastereans, and this was not known before. Um, I think I, um, I've spent like half an hour. Now let's um, come to a very brief summary and outlook. I've shown that bond biomarkers and the free biomarkers are different, but they are also very similar. They show a lot of uh, similar characteristics. Bond biomarkers carry key genetic and maturity information. And we can use the empirical formula to convert biomark bond biomarker ratios to free biomarker ratios if we don't have free biomarkers. Possible applications including the training model contamination, biodegradation, or charging history research. Some outlook. Um, Anything can be done to improve this method. 
the first thing I, I, I'm thinking is to to um, adding more catalyst or or change the ratio of the catalyst against the samples to to re, uh, to improve the bond bond biomarker release uh, so that we can get some uh, biomarkers from high maturity samples. And also perhaps the training can be changed so that aromatic biomarkers can be will not be influenced so heavy and then we can use the aromatic fraction as well. Uh, as I introduced in the beginning, I worked for uh, GEOS4 uh, back when I was in Germany and uh, to carry out this work. Uh, basically, Brian from this uh, from GEOS4, he developed all this method and, uh, and knows everything. So if anyone in Europe want to do uh, cooperation, you can contact uh, Brian directly. Oh, I think that's all for, for my talk. I'm happy to, to discuss with you. Thank you. I hope Hi. you you guys can hear me. Yes, okay. thank you very much. It was a very, very good presentation. I'm sorry for I just joined also one minute before it started because there's lots of ice in Stavanger and I have to be very careful coming in. But any questions from the audience, you can write in the chat or just, I think we are not many people, 18 people. You can just raise your hand and you can just ask the questions. Yeah, just a quick question. Uh, early on, you kind of went over the key parameters for uh, testing the bound biomarkers and you talked about you needed high quantity, uh, but you also kind of showed a, a graph that showed the the abundance and quantity of these bound biomarkers decreasing with maturity. So I'm just curious to know, is this most effective in lower maturity oils or is there some type of cutoff where maturity kind of exceeds the and diminishes the bound biomarkers to a point where they're, they aren't useful or do you have some parameters on that? Yeah, I th so far from my personal experience, a Tmax greater than 440 like this, mm. the generation is too low to to produce a, a reliable biomarkers. But I think it, uh, now I, I'm trying doing some further work to to use bigger amount. Uh, I hope uh, we use more raw material. Uh, so in this way, we, we hope to achieve some bio bond biomarkers at higher maturity samples. At the moment, it's 440. 440, or, no, I appreciate yeah. that, yeah. Any other questions from the audience? Yeah, Michael. Michael. Thanks, a really uh, great talk. Uh, question on uh, kind of mixing and uh, the resolution of quantifying mixtures, maybe with bound versus free biomarkers. Uh, do you have a perspective on that? If you're getting charges from different sources, um, uh, the uncertainty associated with um, estimates of relative charge contributions. If, if you know what I mean, if I'm saying you get in charge from different source rocks, not uh, variable maturity from the same source rock, how um, how much resolution do you think you have in quantifying that potentially? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I, th um, I think if from uh, uh, so far we can just quantitatively uh, differentiate that there are different sources is pretty hard to qualify the the contribution from different sources yeah but you could potentially say which one is the major uh contributor yeah or the most recent contributor i guess from the free bio, uh, free biomarkers yeah sure sure yeah we can just say we can tell which is the main contributor but for is the contribution is to 70 percentage or 80 percentage, that would be hard. Right. right. Yep. Anyone else? I don't see. 
I just as more of a comment and kind of piggybacking on uh, Michael's question. I think historically here in the North Sea and Norwegian Sea, it's always a bit problematic distinguishing between the the Draupa, uh, Draupna and the Melka and the uh, and the or the Draupna and the Heather and the Speck and the Melka. Um, and it's always been a thorny issue. And you know the the heather and the melka tend to be a little bit more terrigenous input, but most of the time we get oils that are a mix of the two. Um, and I saw a lot of droughtna samples in your data set, but um, more of a comment than anything. That would be an interesting thing to see if if bound biomarkers could could be more definitive on on kind of that. Uh, Drought in a spec source rock versus uh, Heather Melka uh, Upper Jurassic source rock. Mm, yeah, the, uh, indeed, it's a pretty hard, uh, hard uh, uh, task. Uh, mm -hmm. As I've shown, that within the Dropnan shale is is heterogeneous. There are very strong marine input and some terrestrial influenced. And from either is also the same. So, from biomarkers, we can, uh, for me, is we can only see how much marine influence or how much terrestrial influence according to the C29 steering or C30 steering. But it's hard to to tell it's it's Dropner or either or or other formation. Yeah, fair point. Thanks. Maybe I've got one uh, one more follow up then. It's on the maturity um, uh, side of things. You know, uh, comparing different source rocks of um, uh, of the uh, a variable thermal history can give you kind of same maturity interpretations depending on uh, when those source rocks generate. So I guess my uh, question is then, if uh, if in the uh, the bound biomarker process, particularly of, uh, of shales, do you think there's any potential that you could be artificially inflating uh, maturity parameters um, in the pyrolysis process um, relative to a kind of um, a much slower geologic process? I guess what I'm trying to get at is how uh, how much resolution you have between uh, your maturity estimates from the bound biomarkers relative to what we're kind of typically used to uh, applying from free biomarkers uh, in geologic samples. Mm -hmm. I know yeah, that's not I, easy. I, that might not be a straightforward question, but. Uh, uh, I think yeah, I I think I've shown the the maturity part pretty fast. I I like this this uh, diagram. It sh it shows a very nice correlation between the the bond T beta over T M. This is the, especially T beta is not a typical biomarker used uh, in free in the free fraction, but it's abundant in the bond fraction, and they can be very well correlated with the the T max. Um. Yeah, uh, and then also the uh, hopping S over R. So from this from this parameter, they see good correlation from others. The correlations are not very good. I have some um, assumption that why they are different because the the free biomarkers, uh, the free oil is a, a mixture of oil generated at a different thermal stage. So if the maturity, the, the character maturity is uh, 0 0.8, the oil inside is the mixture of 0 0.7, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, it's a mixture. But the bond biomarkers we are releasing, it, it shows the, the characteristics of the carriaging. It's just the, it is the, just the maturity of 0 0.8. And that's why they, they are kind of different. But from this perspective, perspective, the bond biomarkers is kind of a reliable when we are uh, talking about the carriage structure. Thanks. Thank you. Maybe our boy, this far boy has a question now from Equinorius. Okay, yeah, thank you for a nice presentation. Uh, uh, I just want to ask regarding the 
T29s terrain and uh, C30s terrains because sometimes when we have uh, oils or extracts from uh, Ordovician or carbonate source rocks, uh, we have a different uh, 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 a different proportion of C29 or C30 than we normally uh, get uh, from a marine or terrestrial type of source rock. So do you see also correlation between the bound and the free biomarkers in terms of C29 and uh, uh, C30 uh, sterains from extracts or oils related with carbonate rocks and also in terms of age, like Ordovician. Because in Ordovician, for example, uh, we have sometimes high C29, which are not really terrestrial, but Mari. Yeah. I got you. Yeah. Uh, you're right. Basically, what, what we I have shown are just some typical marine shale. I know uh, these parameters can be an age-related one, uh, as you said. Uh, the uh, automation samples has some very special distribution, and also in uh, this database, we, this carbonate-rich sample, it does not fall on the the general trend line. Yeah, I have to say I haven't checked the. Uh, the alteration samples or a lot of uh, carbonate rich samples, they might behave different. And also uh, from my personal experience, uh, yeah, C29 is not always an indicator for terrestrial input. It can be some special algae. Yeah, thank you for your question. I think it's definitely something worth it to be worked on in the future. Yep, from anybody else? If not, I can ask a quick one. I mean, you've seen or I've seen that you have very, very many good samples from US shales like Eagle Ford and Bakken. And my question is that have you tried to do a detailed case study of how the composition changes? If you look at the together with PVT reports and detailed compositional data of the primary oil, the first oil generated, looking at the bound biomarkers and then looking at the extracted oil, if you have a big Shale oil producing area. I'm sure it's lots of samples. Maybe it would be good to do. Maybe you've done it something similar already. I don't know. Yeah, it's it's very good suggestion. Yeah, for my uh, our original work was mainly focused on in, in Europe. So the American samples were just just checked as the as a database background. Yeah, not too much work uh, in detail has been carried out. Yeah, as you can yep. see, Thank I you. worked on a lot of the Norwegian, the North Sea samples. Uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 I can see. Yeah. So anyone else, any question? Or we can just call it the end. Mm -hmm. Last chance. Yep. So, Brian, any comments from you? Um, no, uh, aside, apart, can you hear me, by the way? Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've no comments. I think Sheng Yu really gave an excellent presentation. He showed uh, really uh, a very sound analysis of all kinds of things that can influence uh, the biomarker compositions. He's not had a chance to do everything yet. He's only had the chance to work within the boundaries of the industry project. The four sponsors uh, provided samples that they were most interested in. I think uh, it's fair to say that we've looked at some of these same samples, for example, using pyrolysis uh, phase kinetics. We've, uh, we've, we've looked at the asphaltine kinetics. Uh, but we've not yet done an integrated study. Um, maybe that's something for the future. Maybe I'll just sign off. Uh, I think Sheng Yu did a great job and uh, it reflected well not only on him, but upon the uh, the work that was done at GFZ during his time there. So thanks very much, Sheng Yu. Thank you, Brian. Without you, I can't do no, this great work. Don't go into that. Okay, thank you.
Yeah, thank you again for a really good presentation. And I guess for most of you who are interested, it's recorded so you can watch it again. And uh, thank you very much again. And uh, thank you that through the time differences and the time shift, you can still present to us. I guess it's uh, like four or five o'clock in your place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for having me. Thank you for everyone's joining. Yeah. Thank you very much for everybody. And then if